Indeed, all praise and thanks is due to Allah. We praise Him, we seek His help, and we ask for His forgiveness. We seek refuge with God from the evil that is within our souls and from the evil deeds. Whomsoever God guides, no one can misguide. And whomsoever God allows to go astray, no one can guide. I bear witness that there is no deity worthy of worship other than Allah and that Muhammad is his last and final messenger. God says in the Quran, O you who believe, be conscious of God and do not die except in a state of submission. My father came to America after working very hard as a young person. His father died when he was, I think, six or eight years old of leukemia. So my father spent his time studying on the kitchen floor so he wouldn't fall asleep. And he moved around different homes because his mother, my grandmother, didn't have the income to buy for us. She was with one uncle, the other uncle, so on and so forth. And my father eventually studied hard and was third in his school in, in Karachi, the medical school of Pakistan, by the grace of God. And he came to America. He came to America and became a cardiologist. So he fixed his hearts for a living. And he moved to a, a city of, of Dallas, near Dallas, uh, where a highly racial city, where they used to burn black and white churches. And I grew up in that city. That's my background. I grew up being called the sand and word, towel head, camel jockey, rag head, other terms. I grew up having to fight sometimes, go to a detention, go to Saturday school. Somehow I avoided being suspended after that happened. Either way. Because I realized that it's better to fight back once you get in trouble or twice than to keep having a bloody lip on the way back home on the bus. Now I'm not condoning or condemning what I did, but I'm telling you what I did. Right? And my father in this town, he, there are many, many people there, uh, mostly white people and black people, and they're, it's a lower income city. My mother would tell me a deal, you know, your father, he's not charging the patients, some of the patients, because they can't afford the visits. And when I heard, we saw the message from, uh, from, from the president-elect uh, that, uh, you know, that there's a ban, it's a, a ban for Muslims entering this country, I thought to myself, people like my father, who are curing the hearts of Americans every day would not be allowed to come and practice profession here in America. That one day, and probably not too far away because none of these candidates are that young, uh, they may need help with their hearts, not just spiritual heart, I mean physical heart. And they may need cardiologists. And it saddens me that rhetoric that was has been said and um, is being said may trigger some of my father's own patients to go after him because of his name, because of his religion, or because of his skin color. And I find hope in my own scripture, in the Quran, where God says that they, many of some people, not everybody, but some people, try to extinguish the light of God with their mouths. But then God responds, God will protect, will perfect his light. So sometimes these words come 
And we'll talk about how to deal with these words. It's important because I want to open up my life to you a little bit. When I was uh, in college, 9-11 happened. And then, now you all are in college and 11-9 happened. And it was shocking to see what happened when I was in college to see the aftermath, the events and the aftermath of 9-11. And before, people didn't know too much about Islam. I'm not saying they know much right now, but I'm saying before, everybody knew that hopefully we're not drinking and we're not eating pork. That was pretty much it. And maybe the Aladdin movie, right? That's kind of like the extent of the knowledge, right? But then after 9-11, Muslims became notorious because they were known to be this radical, extreme group. But something that I've seen moving up to 11-9 and around that time is Muslims went from notorious to victorious. Now some of you are thinking, how in the world are Muslims victorious right now? That's okay, so I'm gonna get there. Because for the first time in my life, I, start, I started to see people being sympathetic towards, empathetic towards Muslims. I'm seeing it right now with my own eyes. I'm seeing it in the media, I'm seeing it with famous actors and celebrities. And that's, that's for me, is a victory. That for me, where I was growing up, 70, 80% of what was around me was hate. Maybe more, maybe less, but I don't think so. And now it's about half of the nation, right? So for me, things are getting better. Things are improving. When I saw that at the uh, DNC, when Khizr Khan and Ghazala Khan, when they talked about their son who died serving his country, who was Muslim. And then I saw the reaction from uh, the president-elect in his, his camp at the time. And then the reaction that even like Fox News was like defending Muslims, and I was like, oh my gosh. <laughs> like I thought I would never see this in my lifetime. Right? So things started to change all of a sudden. And that's the hope that our nation is built upon. There was a poll by the Brookings Institute that showed both whether it was Republican or Democrat, that the more people knew about Muslims, the more like higher level of knowing of like just like my friend or higher level of like teacher or professor, the more they knew, the more likely they were have they were likely to have a favorable opinion about Muslims. And I see people, we've seen on our Facebook feeds, people are marching and protesting all over, from LA to New York, people in Canada's websites are shutting down for immigration purposes, right? Everybody, everybody's really showing their love and support. But one thing I wanted to, one of the things I wanted to mention today was the idea of critical loyalty. Critical loyalty meaning that you can be patriotic to your country and you can be loyal to your country and still critique it. Because being a good American, like being a good Muslim, is speaking out against wrong in our country and then joining the good in our country. There's nothing wrong with that. Nothing unpatriotic about that. Because if you had a best friend and your best friend wants to go get drunk and then drive, if you don't grab that friend's keys right then and say stop, are you really a friend? So I have no problem critiquing my country when I see it going the wrong way, or people in my country, or elected officials. When I was uh, in different careers, I worked in civil rights, I worked for, uh, as a staff member for a couple of congressional members, and I worked as a chaplain in different places. And I saw my students, uh, sometimes myself, um, and then students before the same campus being profiled by the FBI. They would come in, knock on their doors, bang on them, bother them, harass them on the cell phones, send in informants to go and trap Muslims. And I'm gonna speak out against that. We need the FBI to protect us, we do. 
And if there's something overdone, if they're transgressing, I'm going to speak out against them. When I was working as a congressional staffer, I spoke with families, families who had their husband was in Pakistan and their name was Khan. So for three years, they were in a background check, can't come to America. Or their wife is over there in another country and the wife has Muhammad in her name, so they can't come back. So I spent hours talking to these families on the phone, hearing their pain. And I speak out against that as well. And many of my friends and families are terrified right now because they know at any moment somebody could get angry, impulsive, and commit a hate crime and possibly kill someone. And then it would be called a parking incident or called mental illness or called whatever else. But this is a reality that many Muslims are facing right now. And when we see reactions to the election, like the KKK celebrating after the Trump victory, that really hurts. And it doesn't just hurt me as a Muslim thinking about Muslims. It hurts me as a Muslim thinking about a lot of people. Now, I also want to mention that being Muslim and struggling is not a new thing. I told some of the students the other day that in the early Islamic history, in Arabia, the Muslims were receiving heat. And so the Prophet Muhammad, may God's these blessings be upon him, when they went to go do their religious ritual over the house of God, and then people were watching them, and they were antagonistic toward them, he told them, when you walk around, walk with swag. He said, when you walk, walk hard, jog hard, be confident. And I'm going to get back to that in a minute. But with that, Muslims struggled through the Crusades. They struggled through the Inquisition in Spain, which became Spain. There are other times in, of, of, of much struggle. And there's different people who come. Right? We have stories of Pharaoh, how, how hard Pharaoh was to the children of Israel. We have stories of Abu Jahl in early Islamic history, and so on and so forth. But Muslims are still strong. 1.6 billion Muslims with lots of countries running around. And we're here right in America. And we're going to be strong. And we're going to have swag. Because the swag is the key. I remember there was a time I was reading an article from, I think it was uh, published by either a, a it was a Hillel staffer, a staff person or a Jewish uh, stu student, I can't remember. But she was writing about that in this country, members of the Jewish community were not allowed to get into Ivy League schools. In America, they weren't allowed to get into Ivy League schools. But now, you look at the emblem of Yale, and it has Hebrew on it. You see what I'm trying to say? So I'm saying there is definitely a struggle, but there is a hope in this country that many other countries will never see. Hopefully one day they will see. I don't. Bernie Sanders, who almost won Democratic nominee, uh, nomination, recently endorsed Keith Ellison to be the chair of the DNC. That, to me, is, is hope personified. We have a Jewish-American senator endorsing a Muslim-American congressperson to be the chair of the DNC. How about that? How about that? This is all happening right now. Who would have thought that we would have a woman be, win the popular vote in this country? Win the popular vote in this country to become president when barely 100 years ago women weren't allowed to vote. Who would have thought that we had an African American family in the White House after going through all the struggles that the American community is going through and has been through? 
when I was going through, uh, when I was a young kid, I didn't know too much about the presidents. I didn't know about Reagan or Clinton or Bush. I, just, I knew they were president, I didn't know too much about them. But now, because of social media, because of whatever, all the kids know about Donald Trump. Everybody knows who he is. And uh, I was, I attend an Arabic class in the morning before I come to, uh, come to Claremont Colleges. And uh, I texted my professor and I said, hey, I may be, are we still gonna have class if uh, Trump gets elected? He didn't respond to me, it's okay. <laughs> and then um, I went to class the next day and to my right is like a bigger room and there's 30, 40, 30 to 40 young Muslim It's because of the spirit and because of the legacy. The spirit and the legacy. Because two things no one can ever take from you is your spirit and your legacy. There is a legacy of young boys and girls memorizing Quran even underneath the colonial empires. Still at it. Still at it in America, still at it in England, still at it in Trinidad, all over the world. Our bodies come and go, but the spirit doesn't know how to say no. I don't know how many of y'all have seen uh, Dark Knight Rises. Y'all seen Dark Knight Rises? There's a scene where Bane and Batman get into a fight. I got, I got a point to this message, don't worry about it. They get into a fight and Bane walks up to Batman and says, I wonder what was going to go first, your spirit or your body. And then Batman gets pretty much broken up and he gets thrown into this like pit overseas somewhere and then he's in this prison and then he gets angry and his spirit starts to build. And there's some shady Chinese, shady medicine happening right now where they like push his back, his, uh, his back in and then he gets like ready and jumps off like Michael Jordan and he flies and he, you know, becomes Batman. Because his spirit wasn't broken. Confidence. Remember Muhammad Ali, who passed away recently, who God had mercy on his soul. And you remember how confident he was in the ring. He was so confident that Joe Frazier, his like nemesis, would say, Muhammad Ali used to tell me in the ring, he used to say, I've got God on my side. How are you going to beat me? How are you going to beat God? As he's like punching people in the ring. He has so much swag as an African-American man in the heart of the civil rights struggle, which is not over yet, but I'm saying that in that, in that time, a crucial time, he gave up years of his boxing career in his prime, in his prime, just to be with his beliefs. He didn't want to go overseas to fight. That's confidence. That is swag in the face of adversity. And you know, with that example of Muhammad Ali, you think about our intersection of identities. You know, because things are changing now. They've been changing, but they're changing even more so with our new generations. We're going to have more and more intersectionality of identities and we have to appreciate and love that. Now many people are scared right now because of the power dynamic in that we have a Republican House and a Republican Senate and a Republican President and influence in the Supreme Court. And I suppose that is a valid fear. But I wanted to share a few stories about that. One was I heard a story about an, uh, a Jewish boy uh, talking to his, his mother. And uh, the Jewish boy said, Mom, Trump has America, but Hashem has the entire world. And then we think only in what's in front of us. But in my faith as a Muslim, we believe that God is in charge of all the affairs in charge of Mars and Jupiter and whatever other galaxies are out there. So that gives me a confidence. That no matter what happens, God is my protector. Another Muslim American convert that I know, she uh, works with CNN and NPR and other places. And uh, she was, and many other Muslim families have been scared, how are we going to tell our students, I'm sorry, I was here, uh, how are we going to tell our, our children about 
what's happening with the election, who won like, the morning after, right? And so she told her son, her son said, don't worry, mom, one day I'll become president. And so a lot of times, our youth are the ones who are teaching us lessons. I reflect about how I'm sitting at the Oldenburg table with um, different uh, students from South Asia and reflecting that, you know, our legacy, we've been through trouble with colonialists, but we still survive and we thrive, not only there in Southeast Asia, but here in Oldenburg. You see four tables full of South Asian American students, international students, sitting together. My iPad tells me that I need to needs to cool down before I can use it. <laughs> so I'm gonna put it away. We pause now and we ask God for forgiveness. So when we think about how we're feeling right now, many students, many Americans are in shock. Really depressed, angry, sad, confused, and many Americans are not in shock, feeling really happy and fulfilled. And my pain is not just for the Muslim community. My pain is for everybody who is suffering right now. Because there is a lot of suffering happening. The African American community has been suffering, and is is my speak with some of the members of the African American community telling me that there there's a fear that there's more police brutality that's already happening right now. It's almost as if people are enabled to do more hate. When I speak with members of the Latino community, they're worried about a wall being built. They're worried about the presidential acts that would uh, enable them to, or be protected, would enable uh, deportation to happen. Families would go just like this. Students at these college campuses are worried that they can't be, they won't be here next year? Maybe next, until the end of next semester? That is real pain going on. It is a real pain when we have, we have all family members who are disabled and that a candidate makes fun of those who are disabled. Then they are enabled in many ways, but this is, this is a strong pain that we are seeing. In all these international communities, including the Asian community, the Middle communities, many people are feeling a strong pain. A strong pain that a woman who works so hard, she works so hard as a first lady, as an attorney, as a senator, as a cabinet member and ran for office twice and then won the popular vote. I mean, did everything she could possibly do in terms of credentials and still lose to someone who had no experience outside of being a business person from his father's income, being a reality TV show host, an 18 month campaign. That is real pain. I can't imagine the pain that other people are feeling right now, but I feel a pain with you. Do you understand what I'm trying to say? I don't understand exactly the pain that other, pe other people from other identities are feeling right now, but I feel a pain with you. I feel a pain that I have tears in my eyes talking about this more than my own Muslim community. That is a pain that I'm seeing this nation feel right now. And that is a victory. 
that in a way is a victory because we are finally starting to move together as a community. We're moving together as a community when we have a, the first Latina U.S. Senator. That is a great landmark. We have the first, excuse me, refugee Somali American woman, former refugee Somali American woman, now be a legislator in Minnesota. That is a victory. Things are moving forward. We just have to breathe and understand that for a moment. We have the uh, LGBTQ identified uh, female governor in, I believe, Oregon, right? These things, their society is changing and we're, we can feel we're part of that change. It is so bright, the future is bright, but we have to understand that our society still has ills. There are many ills that we are facing as a community right now. And as hard as it is for me to say this, it was hard to prepare for this khutbah, this sermon, and it's hard for me to say it now. But there are some people in who voted for Donald Trump, and they have some legitimate pain. And we have to say that. Because as a chaplain, I'm supposed to bring in grace situations that aren't that graceful, even though I'm fighting against myself to do it. But there is a pain coming from some people who voted for Donald Trump because they're foreclosing on their homes and they can't get jobs and they can't provide for their families. And as someone who has been unemployed in my life, I understand that depression. It's intense and it hurts and no one should have to go through that. But what I'm trying to say is that if that is a problem, then we as a society should find ways for people to have jobs, be able to support their families so that these types of reactions don't come. And they may not even believe or uh, you know, okay everything that Donald Trump said, but one component, maybe it was that about jobs, is just the preservation of their wealth, to have some wealth, was so big that it enabled them to do that. It pushed them to go that far. And if it's other diseases in their hearts, if it's racism, if it's xenophobia, then we have to be that cure. We have to show them, and it's not a, like a PR campaign, we just be ourselves, and show them how beautiful pluralism is. And that's a gift that many millennials have that people before you didn't have, didn't see. But you are blessing people who came before you and blessing people who will come after you by the way in which so many couples are marrying from different races, ethnicities, and coming together identities. It's beautiful to see that. But I promise you it wasn't as prevalent before, but it probably will be in the future. And that's what you're going to carry with you. After many of us have passed away, that's, what, that's the torch that you're going to carry with you. That is the beauty that we contribute to this society. That the founder of Chobani Yogurt gave 10% of his shares to his employees creating jobs, edible arrangements, Pakistani American, uh, sorry, South Asian American family co-owned, creating jobs. My own father has a small business, he employs 11 people in his practice. So find ways in which you can show the beauty of your culture to other people, because everybody's culture is beautiful, but they haven't seen it yet. And racism can be cured and we are all the cure for that disease. This is the part of the sermon where we offer the prayer. Um, and you can say uh, amen if you like, or you can say ameen if you like, or you can just say quiet whatever you are comfortable with. We ask God to heal our hearts. We ask God to heal our nation. We ask God to bring our nation together. We ask God to eliminate these feelings of racism. We, we ask God to eliminate these feelings of hatred. We ask God to erase this historical pain that has been put upon communities, minorities in this country. We ask God to help people remember the pain and to try to work on healing that pain 
and not reactivating the pain like standing rock or like the African-American struggle. God, we ask you to bring people's hearts, minds, and souls together to stand confident in the face of adversity, to understand that we are one community. And as you have said in the Quran, that we were created in nations and tribes so that we may know one another. God, we ask that you help us to stand together, to worship together, to cry together, to prevent any social justice ills from happening that are in front of us. If they're with our community or another community, because honestly, we are one community and this nation has been divided enough that we can't handle it, handle it anymore. ask you to give us the best in this life and in the next life. Allahumma ahna fi man hadayt wa aafina fi man hadayt. Allahumma azza al-Islam wa al-Muslimin. Allahumma fi al-Islam wa al-Muslimin wa al-Muslimin. Allahumma fi al-Islam wa al-Muslimin. Rabbana ahna fi al-Islam wa 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 al-